Well, good morning, everybody. It is so amazing to see people here. I know we had some people last week, but I just can't tell you how exciting it is to actually be speaking to people. <laughs> For so long, I was trying so hard to look at the stupid camera back there, and it was driving me crazy. So good morning and welcome. I am so happy to be here. I hope you're half as happy to be here as I am, because then that means we are very happy to be here. <laughs> Today we are starting a brand new uh, message uh, series called The Gospel Lens. Uh, and the big idea of this series is going to be that Jesus' death and resurrection ushered in a new way of living in this world. This is going to be a four-week series in uh, the book of Ephesians. And we are going to look at how the gospel should shape how we see and interact with the world. Today's message is uh, called, I was blind, but now I see. And uh, the main scriptures, as you might guess, <laughs> is going to be in Ephesians. And today we're going to look at chapter 1, 1 through 10. If you're taking notes um, and you want to jot anything down, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a spoiler alert right now. The, uh, the big idea for the, today's message is that the gospel of God's grace gives us the ability to see the world in a new way. And uh, a lot of times, that's the main problem. It isn't what's going on, it's how we see it. And so uh, the main point that we're going to try to drive home today is that we have been brought from blindness to sight. And so, new series, Gospel Lens, let's do this. You guys ready? Let's pray real quick. Lord God, I thank you so much for this amazing opportunity to be here with my brothers and sisters in person and online, and I just ask that you will just uh, speak to us as we read through this portion of scripture and look at the truths that you want to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the gospel of God's grace through Jesus should create such a fundamental change inside of us that we transition from blindness to sight. And that's kind of the theme that we're going to roll with. Consider this, uh, consider this metaphor. If you need prescription glasses, I see some people here that are wearing prescription glasses. If you need those glasses without them, you see things a little bit blurry, a little bit more, uh, confusing. Well, the same thing is true in our spiritual lives. If we don't look through the lens or the lenses of the gospel, we might see the world in a skewed way. I've shared this before, <laughs> but in relatively re recent history, I had to get glasses. Now, I rarely wear them up here because it's so that I can see far, uh, because uh, things are a little bit blurry the further away they are. Luckily, the screen that's on the back wall uh, is pretty big, <laughs> and the words back there are pretty good. But when I wear my glasses, it's amazing. I can see street signs a block away. <laughs> it's really awesome. And the first time I put them on, it was like everything was in HD, and I was amazed. However, I rarely wear them. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I meant to bring them here today. <laughs> so that I could put them on and you could see how good I look in my glasses. But I use them so, so infrequently that I forgot to bring them even today as my illustration, which is super sad because I feel like you're missing out. <laughs> but they don't work if you don't use them, right? Right now, I can't see <laughs> very far away. So the gospel is the same exact way. If we don't choose to look through the gospel lens, if we don't choose to look at people the way Jesus sees them, if we don't choose to look through situations in our lives through the gospel lens, it doesn't work. It doesn't change anything. But when we do, when we choose to look through the gospel lens, everything in our life should look different including our relationships, ourselves, families, careers, time, money, priorities. And to understand this truth better, we're going to work through the book of Ephesians. And in this book, Paul lays out uh, the gospel in theological terms, and he also gives us application how to apply that to our lives. 
Uh, before we read what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, let me just ask you, have you guys seen those videos online where they get the glasses that help them see in color? Or when they get a surgery that actually helps them go from blind to sight? And you get to see their reaction. You get to see... I was going to show you an example, but I didn't want to just break down and, and be trying to see through my tears the rest of the message. But you guys have seen those, right? These clips where people, they see their, their loved one's face for the very first time, or they see the color of their spouse's eyes, or they see the blue of the sky or the vivid green of the grass, and they just, most of them break down in tears. They're just so joyful. And that's really the difference that we're trying to talk about. We should react that way when we look at things through Jesus' eyes, through the uh, gospel lens. So imagine, if you can, what it would be like to, to be like those people, to see things through opened eyes. So how do you uh, think that sight changes our life uh, if you've been blind and then you can see? It, it changes everything, right? It changes it in every way. So consider this parallel. Those who don't know Christ, they don't have that option. When they look out, they either don't see or they don't see in color for sure. They see things skewed. They see things uh, blurry and, and, and dark. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul writes when he's writing to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, we're going to see what he has to say uh, to the, the church in Ephesus uh, about this same thing. But it says in that scripture there that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So let's look at uh, Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 2, and uh, it starts with a, 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 a greeting, a pretty generic greeting. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, uh, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why did we read that? <laughs> it's pretty generic. It's pretty standard. Paul puts that at the beginning of all of his letters. Well, this is why it's important. It's important because it makes it clear that Paul is writing to believers. He's writing to the opposite of the people he was talking about to the Corinthian church. He was saying that they are blinded. So when he's talking to this group, when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he's talking about specifically believers, Christians, followers of Christ. And he's offering them a truth. And just like them, we, if you're sitting here, you've put your faith and trust in Jesus. He is your Lord and Savior. So you are a believer. So you are much like the church of Ephesus. We are the church of Las Vegas. And so the same principles and the same truths apply to us today. And so let's read on and see what he had to see, say to those believers because those truths are truths that we can grab a hold of. In verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God uh, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual gift in Christ. So Paul is praising God. What is he praising him for? He's praising him for blessings that came through Christ and he's praising him uh, for a blessing with every spiritual blessing. That sounds pretty all-inclusive, right? Every spiritual blessing. So let's read on uh, verses 4 through 6. It says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship, through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the, uh, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. You see, in these verses, Paul is saying that it was an act of love that God has adopted us, 
This is a big deal. <laughs> Sometimes I don't think that we see this through the gospel lens and realize that when you're blind and you're an unbeliever, when you come to faith, something radical happens. And if nothing has changed, if you're not seeing for the first time and, and, and excited about that, then maybe something has gone wrong and you need to go back to prayer and figure it out. Because it seems to me, uh, unfortunately, that in our culture, unless you get in a very in-depth conversation with someone, you can't tell believers from unbelievers very often. So the gospel is first and foremost a message of how God loves us and how he seeks us out. But also, we have worth and value. Why? Because God loves us. He adopts us and he brings us into, our, uh, into his household. If you've ever felt unloved, if you've ever felt unappreciated, if you've ever felt like you were unwanted, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's not true because God loves you. He wants your company. He has chosen you and he has invited you into his family. That's why when Christians deal with those things, it should be something that we can rally around them and we can have victory over because we can read plainly in scripture that God loves us, that we have value, that he has chosen us. He has adopted us and invited us into his family. Uh, if we go on to verses 7 and 8, Paul continues to reveal more and more about this. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sin in accordance with, his, uh, with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished upon us. I love that word, lavished. It's not something where he just gives a little sprinkle, you know, oh, I, I kind of love you over there and I kind of love you over there. It says he lavishes. You know, he slathers it on. <laughs> That's how God loves us. He loves us in a big way. Our redemption or our rescue has come through Jesus' death on the cross and our forgiveness of our sins. That is a big deal. <laughs> The good news is that our, uh, the debt or the ransom for our sin is paid in full. We have been rescued and our relationship with God has been reconciled because of the payment from another party. Jesus, <laughs> by his death, what was owed and what we could never, ever, ever hope to pay back has been taken care of. It's been paid. That's why we have been redeemed. So many people have been redeemed, but because they don't realize what that means, they go on living exactly the same as they did before. This should be so exciting <laughs> and something that not only should we fully realize in our lives, but it should be something that we want to tell other people. We should be living a life that we can't even believe and we should look around us and see the people that are hurting and the people that are down and the people that uh, don't understand this and we should want to tell them. That should be the thing that's bubbling up inside of us. It's like, do I want to talk to these people about the, the movie series that I'm watching on Netflix? Do I want to talk to these people about this new board game that I got in the middle? No, I want to tell them about Jesus because it's such an amazing thing that I want everybody that I know and care about and even those that I don't know and don't care about to know about this. Think about this. <laughs> Everyone in here has been in debt of some sort, I'm sure, but not all debt is bad debt, right? <laughs> if you work in, uh, in finance, you know that there's such a thing as, as quote unquote uh, good debt. I know it sounds weird, but, you know, they consider a car payment uh, or a mortgage or a student loan that's considered good debt because it's, it's an investment into what you have going on in your life. It's useful. However, even good debt is still a burden, right? <laughs> when you get that mortgage payment in the mail each month, you don't get all giggly, right? <laughs> Woo, I get to pay this because it's good debt. That's just not how it works, right? <laughs> Um, but the point is this, that can you imagine if you got a letter from your mortgage company 
uh, that said, uh, your debt has been paid in full. The whole mortgage has been taken care of, and now you completely own your home free and clear. Uh, don't worry about sending us any more checks. Your debt is gone. That would be exciting, right? That would be something to get giggly over. Well, that is a small, you know, insignificant picture of what redemption means because eventually we would probably be able to pay off that mortgage, right? That's why they give you one <laughs> because they expect you to pay it off. Well, we could never, ever, ever, ever pay the debt for our sin. We could never pay uh, uh, for us to be redeemed, but that's what redemption is. It's so massive. Take having your, your mortgage uh, paid for and think about eternity. <laughs> think about what, what God actually did for us. Only Jesus' death could do that. Verse 7 shows us uh, that the, the, the means for such generosity are the riches of God's grace. And God's grace, by definition, is undeserved favor. We do not deserve anything. And not only does God save us, but he loves us and invites us into his family and wants to have a relationship for us and with us. This might sound a little repetitive, <laughs> but I really want this to get inside of us because I think this makes all of the difference. I could get up here and preach about a, a million different topics, but if we're not looking at who we are through the gospel lens, if we're not understanding what redemption means, what it means to be reconciled to God, if that doesn't do something to us, we're never going to see any of this other stuff differently. God's grace is his favor for us. In, in, in Jesus, in Jesus alone, we experience forgiveness and redemption and the joy of being born again being made a new creation. And, and that's something that's happening over and over as we continue to grow in the Lord. It's a process that we just become more and more and more like Jesus. God is rich in his grace and he lavishes it upon us as his adopted children. The story of our faith is that we were adopted by God because he loves us and we are completely forgiven of all of our sins and we have been redeemed and restored as a child of God in his household. And all of this is possible because of the sacrifice of Jesus and the gracious nature of God. We, we've talked about this before, but, you know, God isn't just up there with a bunch of rules and regulations waiting to, to smash us on the head when we mess up. Just like, ooh, he's, he's, he's drifting off. He's drifting off. I can't wait because then I can, I can crush him like a bug. That's not the God we serve. We serve a God who, who created us to be with him. And then our sin came between us. And he did all of this to get us back in relationship, to rescue and ransom us and redeem us and reconcile our relationships. That's the God we serve, a gracious God, a loving God that wants nothing more than to be in relationship with us. And unfortunately, we accept that amazing gift and then we somehow just forget about it and we just kind of go on with, with our lives. If we read the last couple verses, uh, Ephesians 1, 8 through 10, it says, With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their, fulfill their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. This is the gospel. And this true story, this amazing story, should be ever before our eyes like a lens, like glasses, like the ones that I should be wearing. Shaping how we see and interact with everything in our lives. Everything. 
Because what we need to know is that God is in control. God has a plan. And that plan is unfolding. And we are all invited to be a part of it. But we're never going to be in step with God and fulfilling that plan with him and, him and with his family if we can't see the right things. And so we need that gospel lens in front of us so that we can see all of the things that we need to see. We must discipline ourselves and look at those things through those lenses, not just leave the glasses in the living room by the lamp where they sit and collect dust. So over the next few weeks, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to learn what exactly it means to look through those gospel lenses, how that applies to our life, how we can actually live that out. And I hope you guys are excited, and I hope that you plan to, to do that with us and go on that journey with us. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you once again for just allowing us to be in this place, allowing us to worship together, to lift up your name, to thank you that you lavish your love on us, that you pour out your amazing grace on us, that you want to be in relationship with us. That's the whole reason you created us is because you wanted us to be in your family. I thank you, Lord God. If, if there's anyone here in this place or watching online, Lord, that has never given their life to you, has never put their faith and trust in you, I pray that they will do that right now. And I just pray, Lord God, that as we uh, go on from this place uh, a little bit later on, uh, that you will just continue to remind us of these truths and help us to get these truths inside of us, get the, the, what, what Paul had written to the church in Ephesus, Lord God. Let us understand it and let us learn to see th things through that gospel lens. We love you. We thank you. You're an amazing God. In Jesus' name, amen.